All right, well, in the interest of getting ourselves started, and um, I'm not sure I, if I can actually see how many people are online. Do we know that there are people? We do, OK. Um, all right, so I just want to um, start off by welcoming you, uh, welcoming Dean Nina Levine in the, from the College of Arts and Sciences, who's going to say a few welcoming remarks to you. Nina. So thank you, Anne. Can you can you hear me? It's working. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, so it's really on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences that it is my pleasure this morning to welcome you all to the University of South Carolina. Um, I think a number of you um, are brave souls and you have, you know, dealt with the airlines and airports and the security checking um, nightmares and made it here. So that's, that's great. I hope you're settled into your hotels. Um, Columbia, I think you'll find, or I hope you'll find, it's a pretty welcoming city and the weather's cooperating beautifully today and this weekend. So I hope you'll have, even if you don't get out into the streets of Columbia, at least you can wander around the campus. Um, it's a beautiful campus and we're actually having autumn here now. So so that's wonderful too. And and there's also the State House grounds, I should say, and some of you may want to look at the the uh, monuments and you can see something of the history of the state and not only the history of the state, but current um, current questions. Um, I also want to extend um, deep thanks to Amber Ziedenhout from and her team for making this conference happen. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Anne in the past and I know firsthand her terrific ability to combine vision with the kinds of, um, well, to, to bring visions to reality. And she does it um, with great skill. And as we all know, there's a lot of work involved. Um, and most of that work is invisible. So um, thank you, Anne, and your team for all the work that you've done to, to bring, um, bring everyone together for this conference. I also want to say a word about the visible work of this conference, um, your work and why you're all here. Um, it really strikes me in looking over the program, um, the, the, inter, the interdisciplinarity um, is on display um, beautifully, I think. And, you know, interdisciplinarity has long been a, it has long been a buzzword. Um, for colleges of arts and sciences, administrators talk about it all the time. Um, everyone talks about how we need more of it, um, why it's so important, but we also feel, I think sometimes the question of how do we do it um, and that talk is easy. Um, and then many, many of our colleagues are still sort of in their, in their lanes. Um, but it seems to me that linguistics and language study and communication are really fields that that resist such borders and instead model um, sort of interdisciplinarity at its best and both in theory and in practice. And as I look over the program, I'm, I've, I've really been struck by the stunning breadth of the papers, which which look at language um, within an unusually wide range of fields. And just, just to give you some what I was able to glean from medical and public health to psychology, education and pedagogy, social media, um, local and global politics, racial and gender identity, sports and the affective registers of everyday exchange. Um, and this is only a partial sort of categor categorizing list of, of the papers. Um, and it's a pretty impressive list. I'm also very struck by the currency of the work that's being done here and the way it speaks to our world today and not just not just to sort of analyze it, but also to sort of start to chart maybe some path forward or possibilities of where we of where we can go. So it's it's more than just critique in that sense, but but something sort of larger um, 
and and I think this is all to say that this is going to be a very exciting and an important conference and and with with some emphasis on the second part of that. Um, so it's probably time for the games to begin. And in closing, I just want to um, say very simply how good it is to have you all here and um, to thank you for convening this conference at the University of South Carolina. So welcome. Yeah. Yes, we understand. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, Isvan Keshkes, the president of the of AMPRA, is going to make some remarks now. Um, dear conference participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth international conference of the American Pragmatics Association. And first of all, I want to express my thanks to the University of uh, South Carolina, Columbia, that they are hosting this conference. Tens of years passed since the American Pragmatics Association was established at the University of uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, in 2012, with great plans for developing a strong organization to support pragmatic research in the Americas and all over the world. During these 10 years, OMPRA has grown into an influential international association with regular biennial conferences, which have been drawing scholars from 30, 35 countries all over the world. This is mainly due to our effort to be as inclusive as possible, giving forum to all subfields of pragmatics. If you look into the program of this conference, you see what I mean, because basically uh, we have uh, here sessions, talks on linguistics, pragmatics, cognitive pragmatics, politeness research, intercultural pragmatics, contrastive pragmatics, uh, socio-pragmatics, and so on. OMPRA has survived the dark years of pandemic. We have made special efforts to keep the organization alive. We organized an international online symposium at the Universitat de Belgrano, Buenos Aires, under the leadership of Professor Alejandro Parini. The symposium was a great success, and we were especially happy because that was our first event in South America, and we really wanted to involve uh, the Americas into this uh, organization, so that was our first step to do that. OMPRA has also made serious efforts to involve graduate students into its activities. Now we have a graduate council and uh, at this conference around uh, uh, 26, 27 uh, doctoral mm -hmm. students will be present uh, at the conference. The OMPRA graduate student travel awards were very, very competitive this year and we selected eight uh, students for the award and the awards will be given to the students uh, at our business meeting tomorrow. It is also very good news that we, that we managed to start a new book series with Rutledge. The book series is titled Rutledge Series in New Waves in Pragmatics. I initiated the, this book series especially for early career uh, uh, scholars and uh, uh, scholars, young scholars uh, who finished their dissertation five years before the submission of uh, uh, their proposal to us will be considered. So the book series has already started. We have published two books and there are six new ones in the pipe. So after all, it is going very, very well. And there is a great interest among early career scholars uh, in this book series. Uh, it was extremely uh, difficult to find a venue for the conference during mm -hmm. the uh, pandemic and first, you know, we wanted to be uh, at British Columbia, but it didn't work out because they were not ready to kind of organize a hybrid conference. So uh, we are much obliged to the University of South Carolina for hosting this conference here. I would like to use this opportunity to express on behalf of OMPRA our appreciation and thanks to Professor Anne Bezunenhoit 
executive secretary of Ampra, who has done a fantastic job with her team to make this conference happen. Thank you, Anne. Uh, finally, I'd like to invite you to participate in the Ampra Business Meeting from 4 to uh, 4 30 to 5 on Saturday in the Lumpkin Auditorium. The meeting is open to all Ampra members and all other participants. Uh, we are going to make some important announcements at that meeting, including uh, the venue of our next conference. So now, I wish you a fruitful reward and rewarding and enjoyable professional experience at the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, East Button. Um, OK, now transitioning to the uh, first keynote speaker. Um, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Elena Semino, our first keynote speaker and the opening act of the fifth biennial American Pragmatics Association Conference. Elena is a professor in the Department of Linguistics and English Language at the University of Lancaster, and she's a prolific scholar who's made important contributions to many subfields of linguistics and um, related areas of research. For example, made, she has made valued contributions to corpus linguistics, metaphor studies, health communication, stylistics, medical humanities. And her work addresses questions and issues that have great social relevance, such as young people's talk about climate change, online line discussions about vac vaccination hesitancy, about which we'll hear some more in a moment, uh, talk about mental health and about supporting cancer patients. The University of Lancaster has a reputation for being one of the leading institutions in the field of corpus linguistics, in no small measure due to Eleanor's masterful use of corpus methods to study metaphorical uses of language, um, which is a tricky thing to do because you need to develop procedures for identifying metaphors that can be applied systematically and with intersubjective reliability, which is a much harder task than marking up the parts of speech of the words in a corpus. Um, Eleanor can collaborates widely and is involved in many funded research projects, uh, such as a recently funded project whose aim is to produce improved cancer outcomes through user-centered research and has received what amounts, according to my calculations, close to a million US dollars um, over the next five years. Um, anyway, I think you can appreciate that we have a very distinguished scholar with us today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Elena Semino to address us on the topic, conflict discussions of vaccinations on the Parenting Forum, Forum Mumsnet. Thank you so much for this. I am now going to, I won't be able to see you now for a while. So um, please bear with me. So thank you so much for that introduction, Anne, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, this conference has had such a troubled history due to COVID. I'm so glad it's going ahead today. I just regret not being able to be with you today, but I'm glad I can join you um, at least digitally. Um, OK, so um, today I'm going to talk about one of the projects I'm involved in uh, and specifically talk about uh, conflict in discussions of vaccinations on the Parenting Forum Mumsnet. Uh, I'll now explain how I ended up um, talking about this topic. Um, OK, so um, basically the background to this is vaccine hesitancy um, and uh, the role that online communication plays in the development of views about vaccinations and the risk of polarisation that has been associated with online communication about vaccinations. Um, I will talk to you specifically about what we're beginning to discover through a project called Questioning Vaccination Discourse, a corpus based project uh, for short, Quo Vadis. Um, and specifically, I'll tell you about a study that we have conducted on a section of the online parenting forum Mumsnet called Am I Being Unreasonable or IBO? I'll explain all of that, but you'll see that one of the interesting things about this project, which I should say up front, is that we've ended up uh, potentially seeing the role that conflict and uh, its polarizing consequences uh, play uh, in discussions between people who are maybe pro or anti vaccinations, but where the people uh, responsible for the conflict are the people who are pro vaccination. 
the people I regard because everybody has a position on this in a sense as my tribe. So it's been quite a sobering um, project and then I'll draw some conclusions. OK, so as early as 2019, before the COVID pandemic, uh, the World Health Organization um, listed 10 global health threats, and one of them was vaccine hesitancy that they define as a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of vaccination services. And as I've already mentioned, uh, views about vaccinations that then result in decisions about vaccinations um, are known to develop in discourse um, and specifically uh, online communication has been identified as a source of uh, both discussions, interactions, the, the formation and negotiation of views and potential polarization. And uh, in previous studies of online communication about vaccinations, people have focused on different types of conflict and antagonistic rhetoric, but focusing particularly on the behavior of people who might, broadly speaking, be described as anti-vaccination. OK, so let me introduce uh, the, the broad sort of um, characteristics of the project that I'll be drawing from, uh, Quo Vadis. Um, so Quo Vadis, um, so I should say, although uh, very few people believe me, that um, I clicked to submit on the uh, application for funding for Quo Vadis to the UK government on the 21st of January 2020. So at the time um, we knew about a virus in China, but this was conceived of entirely pre-COVID. And but the project has been sort of slightly derailed by COVID in the sense that obviously looking at vaccinations now is very different from looking at vaccinations pre-COVID. Um, I, I could give a whole other lecture as to how we're adjusting to that. Um, but anyway, the project applies corpus-based discourse analysis to uh, discussions about childhood vaccinations. This was, this was, was our original focus and I'll be talking about a, a vaccination administered in uh, adolescents today. In corporate drawn from uh, social media, so Twitter, Reddit and Mumsnet, and Mumsnet is the topic of today's talk, UK news reports and parliamentary debates uh, recorded in Hansard records in the UK since 1830. So the team is quite big. Uh, today's uh, collaborators for the, this specific study are uh, Tara Coleman Patel and William Dance, who are researchers on the project, Sophia Demian from UCL and Claire Hardacre also at Lancaster. But the broader team involves other people, including, uh, for example, uh, Richard Gleave, who is a, uh, the UK Health Security Agency. As Anne was saying, you can't do this research within just one discipline. OK, so uh, let me tell you uh, about Mumsnet, which is where we draw data from for this study. Mamza is an online parenting forum um, which was founded uh, by uh, two UK based uh, people in 2000 uh, and their quote, I quote their goal to make the lives of parents easier by providing them with easily accessible childcare information, advice and solutions. Um, it is, uh, it, it has a, a very high number of interactions, so they report 1.2 billion page view a, views a year and in 2019 they reported uh, more than 100 million unique user visits. And really they are, so th there's a lot of uh, people, obviously there are lots of people from the UK, uh, many from the US and other English speaking countries, it's, it's, it's all in English. And over time, it has acquired considerable political power. So one of the things that Mumza does is interview politicians. And I've, I've put, uh, you can see the names of some of the politicians they've interviewed. They interview very high status people. And, and the fact that people accept these invitations for interview is because of the political uh, power that Mumza has. But why is it relevant particularly to us? Well, we were interested, we are interested in childhood vaccinations, and this is a parenting forum. But in addition, there was a study in 2017 of parents in England, and uh, within a survey, uh, 626 parents said that they use the internet as a source of information about immunization. And out of those, uh, just under a third, 29%, specifically mention Mumsnet as the place they go to to find out about immunization. 
Um, this was a bit less than uh, the NHS, the National Health Service website, which is 36%, but more for that sample of people than Facebook and Twitter, which were mentioned uh, each by 13% of parents. So it's influential uh, in the context of people, at least in England, making decisions about vaccinations. Uh, more specifically, uh, Mumsnet is a very large website that includes all sorts of sections. One of the sections is an online forum called Mumsnet Talk. And Mumsnet Talk, sorry, my clicker, oops, just bear with me. Uh, Mumsnet Talk includes uh, over 200 topics, and the largest and busiest topic is Am I being a reasonable or eyeball? Uh, and this is basically a place where people go and uh, the, origin, the, the original poster of each thread um, outlines a situation in which they got upset, frustrated, angry, and then they ask everyone else whether they're being unreasonable in their reaction. And then people reply uh, to that. And as you can see, I won't go through the figures, IBO represents a quite a large proportion of Mumsnet talk and it's not topic specific because people can uh, ask about their reasonableness or unreasonableness about a whole ra range of different um, situations. Now uh, in the work preceding ours, uh, Mumsnet generally and IBO specifically have been described as more lively, confrontational, combative than other topics on Mumsnet talk. And in fact, Mumsnet itself has a reputation for being more confrontational, more sort of open and straight talking than other parenting forums. And within Mumsnet, IBO has this reputation. Um, uh, so we, uh, so there is a literature on this. And what we did was we uh, examined all uh, just over 200 mentions of IBO itself in our data about vaccinations, which I'll introduce in a moment. In 27% of these cases where IBO is specifically mentioned, uh, Mumsnet users comment explicitly on the communicative style that they associate with IBO and say things like, uh, and uh, warning for uh, swear words, it's IBO, it's like the mothership to rude fuckers, it's IBO expect rude. So this precedes our study. So we were particularly interested in IBO uh, in relation to vaccinations, because if indeed there is a tendency towards conflict in uh, such a large um, uh, forum uh, topic within the forum, uh, then this could lead to an increase of of polarization and polarization as we know very well is an issue in many areas of society and politics including vaccinations so very specifically what we wanted to do first of all we wanted to see where, whether we can actually find linguistic evidence that IBO is more combative than the rest of Mumsnet talk because people have done sort of qualitative studies and then uh, quoted users like we have more specifically, what forms this conflict might take, and then spe more specifically still, how it manifests in relation to discussions of vaccination, especially with a concern for potential polarization. Okay, so here's our data. And here I have to acknowledge the two researchers, Tara and William, who uh, collected the data, as well as my colleague, Andrew Hardy, uh, who's not part of the project, but was very helpful. Uh, so we collected, threads that contain jab, vaccine or vax, you see how they're spelled, with an asterisk, it's a wildcard, so any other character following that, with optional prefixes of un, re, pro, anti, uh, in the original post of the thread from the start of Mumsnet in 2000 to the point when we were collecting the data in, 20, uh, in May 2021. And specifically for this study, we're focusing on all, all of the relevant threads from IBU, and then from three health-related topics on Mumsnet, and you've got them in the table, coronavirus, general health, and children's health. In other words, to uh, achieve our first objective, we needed to be able to compare IBU with other sections of Mumsnet talk in order to see whether we can find any evidence for the claim that IBU is particularly combative. And you've got the number of threads and the number of words for each of the sections. Um, and, you, and you can see the total uh, number of threads and words in the data set. 
At this point, we use the corpus linguistic technique called keyness analysis. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, keyness analysis involves um, uploading onto uh, uh, software that does all sorts of magic. Uh, your corpus of interest, your data set of in interest, in our case, IBO V, so all the discussions of vaccinations on IBO, uh, which in corpus linguistics is called the target corpus. And then a suitable comparative corpus, what is known as the reference corpus, which in our case are discussions of vaccination on those three other uh, sections of mums net talk, coronavirus, general health and children's health. And what the software does, it compares the relative frequencies of words in your target corpus, I, I for us, and the reference corpus I've just described, and gives you uh, a rank ordered list of words that are used much more frequently in the target corpus versus the reference corpus, and those are known as keywords. So we did this keyness comparison. We used an effect size measure uh, called log ratio to decide that somebody, something is a keyword and our minimum threshold was one, which means that to count as a keyword, uh, a word needed to have at least double the relative frequency in uh, IBO versus the reference corpus. And we uh, ended up uh, with 323 uh, um, keywords uh, which we then divided thematically into 15 groups. And you've got the groups there, so you can see the group on the, uh, in the table on the left, and then some example keywords for, from that group, and then the number of keywords, type uh, keywords in each group. Uh, now uh, I'm going to show you that there were some groups of keywords where we could find some potential evidence that IBO might indeed involve more conflict than um, other parts of mums that talk. So let's look at the people group. So the people group was relatively straightforward to classify. It includes references to people generally, such as girls, kinship terms such as mother, in-laws, etc. And this is an example of an original post that includes multiple references or that explains why we ended up with uh, more references to people uh, in, in uh, IBU than the reference corpus. So the title is Give My Child Additional Vaccinations, and the person says, I have opted to vaccinate my toddler against chickenpox and meningitis B, four separate jabs at quite a cost, but one I consider to be worth it. Certain members of my family have told me this is unfair to my child to put her through trauma of extra injections and unnecessary. They're implying I'm some sort of cotton wool parent to do this and I need to relax a bit more. She's about to have the flu vaccine nasal spray to which they roll their eyes, even though it is recommended by the NHS. Would other people think this way of me? So one of the things we notice here that the reason why we end up with references to people, especially kinship, terms as keywords is because people outline this kind of situation, that they end up with a kind of dilemma related to vaccinations that is caused by uh, kind of disagreements within the family. And we have many where people are undermined in their decisions by family members. Then we've got a group of words that we broadly uh, subsumed under communication. And some of these in, are apologize, offensive, patronizing, abuse, polite. So these are when people use sort of uh, uh, kind of different kinds of expressions to characterize and usually criticize the behavior of others on um, IBO. And uh, here's, for example, a concordance of patronizing. Uh, so, uh, and I, I want to give you an example. So at one point, one person says, so bug off with your sneering, patronizing comments. And so we followed this up to see what uh, uh, pushed somebody to, to comment, make this comment. And it was like this. So you will remember, although I'm not sure uh, whether it played out internationally in the same way, but if you cast your mind back to the introduction of the first COVID vaccines, um, uh, one of the first to be approved was the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And uh, after a few months, there was some evidence that uh, there were side effects that hadn't been identified during the clinical trials, especially different kinds of thrombosis. So one person starts a thread on uh, Mumsnet Talk where she says, I'm a healthcare professional. 
um, I've been involved in vaccinations, etc. I've had the first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, but now I'm concerned about having the second one because of these reports. And uh, this person at the top in the little sort of grey box, uh, somebody replies like this. OP, if you don't want the vaccine, don't have it, but do stay at home and isolate and read conspiracy theories ad nauseum, OK, and nauseum is spelled, etc. So somebody puts this person in the box of someone who believes conspiracy theories and and kind of uh, presents her as something, somebody who's uh, against the vaccines. So the original poster then comes back and basically is, establishes her legitimacy as somebody who is in fact generally pro-vaccination. So uh, uh, she says, I'm expressing my concerns relating to expert medical opinions in European countries, not conspiracy theorists. Then she talks about further concerns about the AstraZeneca vaccine and then gives more detail. And then you can see that paragraph. So bug off with your sneering, patronizing comments. I've promoted this vaccine. I've had the vaccine. I work in a vaccination center. I'm not uninformed, etc. So here we find via words such as patronizing, which could suggest sort of traces of conflict, we can follow up the kinds of conflicts involved. And one of the things that you can see here, uh, which I'll uh, mention again as I go along, is that actually, broadly speaking, in fact, both people here are pro-vaccination. So the, the, the person uh, the re who produces the reply uh, is pro-vaccination, and the person who expresses his concerns is also generally pro-vaccination, but has uh, some reservations about the AstraZeneca vaccine, which at the time were entirely reasonable given the reports that were being uh, um, spread, uh, and including in the mainstream media, etc. So uh, let me take another group of keywords. Uh, we ended up with a group of keywords to do with vaccine attitudes. Remember that both the target corpus and the reference corpus are about vaccinations. They were collected in the same way, but there were more uh, instances of anti-vax and anti-vaxxers, relatively speaking, in uh, IBO than elsewhere. And generally speaking, the people who write on Mumsnet um, tend to be um, uh, educated women in, of childbearing age. And broadly speaking, they're more pro-vaccination than anti-vaccination. So the descriptions of anti-vaxxers tend to be very negative. And in fact, these are the collocates of anti-vaxxers, the top 10 collocates of anti-vaxxers in IBO. Um, and you can see that they're all negative, rabid, vocal, denying, mad, hate, selfish, genuinely wonder, opinion, and dangerous. Um, I, we could talk more about these, but let me take, I took one, uh, anti-vaxxers collocating with selfish and again try to follow up what happens around those descriptions of anti-vaxxers as selfish. And so this is another uh, little case study of a certain type of interaction. So uh, here's the original post uh, and we'll get to the selfishness in a moment. So this person, uh, the post is entitled to think this takes not vaccinating to a whole new level. Uh, dear daughter has a child at school who has cancer. The school sent a letter home asking all parents to please think about giving their child the MMR, measles, mumps and rubella vaccine if they haven't had it, and also to inform them immediately if any child was in contact with chickenpox. One of the mums at the school is still refusing to have her three DC dear children vaccinated. No health issues. It's big pharma poison conspiracy theory crap. I boo, am I being unreasonable at this point, to think the school should seek removal of the children and tell the bloody sicko to find another school for them. So somebody posts this at uh, 12.31 on uh, September 26, uh, um, 2016. And then uh, uh, shortly after, one person replies, where do provaxes stand with kids like my DD, my dear daughter, who collapsed and almost died from her eight week immunizations. Other two kids fully vaxxed. So here I find this interesting because here we've got somebody who has two fully vaccinated children and who um, has another child who 
collapsed, we don't know why, and almost died after a particular vaccination. And so clearly it is now uncertain about additional vaccinations for that child. And interestingly, also that person says, where do Provaxes stand, right? So this person is not positioning herself as a Provaxa, but he's asking about Provaxas. Now, the immediate replies to this person, uh, and notice this is, there's one four minutes later, are sympathetic. We would say, so somebody else who uses we as Provaxas, we would say you should get a medical exemption. Your reason is not bullshit wool. But then the thread continues, and just a few minutes later, six minutes later, we get another angry post. Anti-vaxxers are selfish knobheads of the higher, highest order, in my opinion. And then the person basically goes on to say that unvaccinated children shouldn't be allowed to go to state schools and ends their post with dickheads. So here you can see the, uh, the, the polarization between uh, pro and anti-vax people, but also how in essence, somebody who might be generally pro-vaccination but hesitant for a particular incident might feel alienated by this uh, way in which um, people are being positioned on one side or the other. And don't get me wrong, I totally sympathise with the situation where, 